फिर से करो इन एवरी हार्ट बीट ऑफ लाइफ there's a story i was able to relate to sufi poetry so much or the sufi thought process so much because i completely resonate with that sort of belief system that god is a friend with each shared experience there is an invitation to each one of you to introspect to question how does this resonate with me he's always there to uplift you he's a personal god you don't have to go through rituals to reach him So when I went to Mumbai people now call me brave join us as we dive into tales that feel the written from the pages of our own lives but I didn't think I was foolhardy not that I think I was brave I thought I was taking calculated risk reflect on each narrative and ponder how these tales mirror your own journey because in every shared story there's a spark waiting to ignite your own path of personal transformation this is Saljanya your host welcoming you to our new new series the change catalyst from attitude maker welcome on board to attitude maker with smita thank, thank you so much thank you so much thank you for thank you for having me you did your engineering and then got into the corporate world yeah through in the beginning how did that happen and when did you decide to I got into engineering because I felt uh, that um, monetary I mean financial independence would come easily and because I didn't know whether I would be a success as a musician um it seemed tough and it seemed like a long and arduous journey with no um uh, set milestones or given milestones or given destinations to reach in the bargain or I mean that that path was not defined mm-hmm. so one did not know where one would reach mm. so i made a backup plan and i thought let me do my engineering and let me earn some money uh, although i was not thinking money when i decided to do engineering but then luckily god gave me a job and the job was good and i had i built my financial comfort from then uh, but music was all along like i mean it was my constant companion mm. and at one point i started missing music on a larger scale you were practicing while working also. practicing and performing as well oh okay. yeah okay. i used to go off on the weekends perform and come back on monday morning and sit at my desk trying to work all uh, you know sleepless nights uh, with where were you performing in bangalore across uh, karnataka maharashtra wherever i would get called i would go and perform so it was classical concerts which, which means you don't get paid very much i would mm-hmm. travel by bus to these small locations sing and come back it was tough nevertheless i enjoyed that journey and then uh, so at one point i started feeling i want to do music more mm-hmm. uh, but then i let that happen uh, so when I, i was when i had my daughter it was easy for me to say now i'll transition okay. to becoming a full time musician and mom so that transition. that's when you Till then you were in what Oracle SAP yeah huh? yeah what were you doing I have uh, always done quality management okay so uh, process oriented quality management is what I did mm. and that also suited my personality it suited my music <laughs> so I you uh, must been a go to person for all cultural things in the office as well right no not really i used to be i used to participate huh. but not the go to person no? person there oh. were several others who were more enthusiastic <laughs> i uh, i couldn't uh, spend a whole lot of time i can't in fact spend a whole lot of time in any social uh, um, I, because as an artist we have our work we have our concerts we have something else to do we have rehearsals we have so much packed already we don't mm-hmm. have much time to devote to any such hobby where we give it a lot of time yeah. because all these uh, we are already preoccupied <laughs> as it is when you're learning were your uh, gurus upgraded gradually or were you self learning in this duration self learning ha- happens throughout mm. but uh, i changed i went from uh, pr bhagwat guru ji to uh, pandit arjun sana kod then when he passed away then to his son pandit bhal chandra kod sometime vishwanath nakod ar pandit arvi sontake then I had a chance to do a small workshop kind of thing with uh, mrs bose and then i went on to uh, dr alka dev marulkar so uh, many and i have learned from varsi brothers so many uh, i have been blessed to have very good gurus so were you finding them or how is that happening because 
here's why I'm asking you this. Uh, when I was in the corporate world, there was work and there was home. But you have work, home, and plus this, yeah. and the you know um, travel to these various destinations. So it's almost like you're living four parallel lives. Yeah, that's why it was difficult. So when the child came in, it was like my I had my legs in too many boats. Mm-hmm. So I had to you know size down. So Guruji's, I don't think you can find a Guruji. Guruji happens to you. I mean, it's you you. Uh, sort of keep wanting some Guruji to teach you and if you are blessed you will get that Guruji to teach you. So how did Varsi happen? Because I had a strong craving towards reaching my music to many more people that's why I started singing Sufi mm-hmm. music. Mm-hmm. Uh, also I had myself found so much solace in it I felt like sharing it. Mm-hmm. So that started and when uh, uh, when I had learned uh, quite a few things on my own I felt it needed uh, I needed to be taught by uh, uh, le- uh, sort of I needed to be a part of a lineage which has authentic Sufi Kalam uh, which is coming down from you know Hazrat Amir Khusro's time mm-hmm. so Varsi brothers were there in Hyderabad and I could learn from them they taught me so many good Kalams and uh, uh, so much good poetry and uh, I figured out that Hyderabad has a whole lot of uh, good poetry which is uh, not celebrated as much as the poets of Lucknow or Delhi. Mm. So I, uh, I all Hyderabadi poets have always been my favorite because there's a certain maturity, sort of a certain amount of spirituality which they bring in. And even if they're writing uh, a normal ghazal which is uh, naughty and mischievous, it, it, somehow I enjoy it, uh, what they've written. So from these early years through SAP Oracle, then quitting, before that, when you travel to all these places, what was your experience like? It was joyous. It was joyous because the hardship of going on, you know, stepping onto a bus with, where, you know, people come with all sorts of luggage, sometimes bed bugs and things like that, to going there, performing, getting the audience feedback and people loving your music, coming back with that high is something else. You it's forget the all money, the pain. It's that whole yeah, it's not money at all in scene. that uh, yes. in that uh, level because yes. there's no money, literally yeah. no money. Yeah. I would be paid uh, five hundred thousand, two thousand, five thousand. Oh, I don't think I've yeah, I don't think I've earned more than ten thousand during those days. Okay, but uh, yeah, if it was a government festival, maybe one would be paid. Hmm. But uh, biggest amounts of money started coming to me when I started singing lighter forms of music. Let me be very frank. Lighter like? Uh, lighter like I started singing Vachanas, Dasar Padas mm. and so on. Sufi, Ghazal, mm. uh, Filmi. Uh, now I, I can, uh, you know, expand and I can, uh, can sing. I can ask for a budget and I can ask for a good fancy budget sometimes. Uh, and depending on the number of musicians I take and how what kind of a bright sound I can deliver, I can get that. But earlier it was unthinkable to get these kind of budgets. Mm. But I also thank people uh, on the journey who helped me in my pricing uh, in the way it should be marketed and some good tips that were given by my mentors, which really helped. Otherwise, it's difficult for a normal person to think that art also should go through like a like product strategy, strategizing yeah. and life cycle or yeah. marketing. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to think of it that way. Yeah. And we are taught that music should be spiritual. Artists should have only one meal a day. Uh, those kind of things are ingrained to us. That's those are the wrong beliefs. It's a it's a limiting belief. Yeah, yeah and I, I went to one workshop, Smita. There was this young girl who was conducting this workshop, and she asked all of us to close our eyes and think of an artist and think of words that come immediately to your tip of the tongue. There were words like creative, um, you know, solitude and all that stuff. Then there was also. Poor, poverty, <laughs> sadness, loneliness, <Yeah. laughs> all kind. And then I was like, oh my God, because I switched from uh, the corporate world to podcasting. And I think for me, this is my art form. Yeah. And to your point, no one talks about there's a strategy around this. This is yeah. how it goes about. Yeah. And it was shocking initially for me to. Me too. So you need yeah. someone to guide you. Yeah. And that really changed the game entirely for me. And also, if see, if it's a beautiful product that you have, you should also place it and position it that way. Yeah. If you try to use 
uh, I mean, in in classical and Sufi world, you're taught to underplay. You're taught that modesty is good. Somewhere there is a clash of spirituality versus this capitalistic attitude that we bring in. Yeah. But it has to be a blend so that your product reaches the maximum number of people. Yeah. Uh, even if you're trying to give a divine message or a message that the divine has given you, trying to spread any love or whatever in the society, even that has to be spread in the first place for it to reach people. Yeah. So it has to be carried and one has to know how to uh, send it across. Yeah. Probably none of the Vachanakaras or Basveshwara, Basveshwara, Basavanna or Akamaha Devi, they, need, they didn't worry about how their message would get spread across. Yeah. But till today we are celebrating it. Kabir, yeah. Meera, yeah. we are celebrating Baba Bhulle Shah, Bedam Shah Varsi, Hazrat Amir Khosro. We are celebrating their works even till today. Yeah. They didn't think of all this. But for low mortals like us, we have to <laughs> spread our <laughs> art. <laughs> and we have a light, living also to make over here, yes, right? Yes, yes. So, how long did you continue these, um, you know, remote bus routes and all that before you said, okay, I'm ready? For a good 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. For a good 10, ten years, years, you're working in the corporate world doing this? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And for a good 10 years, I would put money from my corporate job into my music. Means music was not self-sustaining. True, true. So wow. I've done all that. Then I said, uh, now from a particular year, it has to be break-even or positive. Yeah. Now, uh, at this stage of life, I say that it has to be positive. I have to earn a certain amount of money. I have to bring back a certain packet yeah. to fund my household. Yeah. Only then I would take it up because it's not worth the effort if not, if it's going to give you nothing. Unless I'm associated with the cause specifically True. and I'm uh, singing for the cause, then it's fine. Yeah. Like uh, I sang one concert for a cancer uh, uh, research institute or uh, for polio, um, rotary polio project, mm. uh, eradicating polio project. Those kind of things are fine. Mm. But if otherwise, uh, once a year I would do that. Got it. Uh, that is done once a year. But beyond that, it has to bring back a certain amount of money. Otherwise, how will my household run? And I also tell my listeners nowadays, I mean, anyone who's trying to get in touch with me for a concert, that look, I mean, it takes a number of years to get till this point. Yeah. And if one has put aside a software career, what I can give you probably has that kind of added value that I have given up uh, a, a software job and come here my passion my learning uh, my the learnings and uh, f sort of uh, takeaways that uh, come yes. from a corporate job all that is with me and then I'm trying to serve you this art with utmost uh, passion and uh, uh, love yeah. so probably it has some different flavor which you would probably enjoy and you should pay for that because you're supporting an art form yeah. you're supporting artists yeah. And if artists mm -hmm. don't get paid this much, they will always have to hold on to day jobs. Yeah. Which means they can't plunge into it as they would like to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the sad, sad state in India. That we don't uh, support traditional arts to that extent. Because all the money is being taken away by those who sing more popular kinds of music, which is Bollywood. Yeah. If Bollywood takes away all the money, then what will uh, you know independent traditional musicians do? Okay, folk music musicians also get a lot of uh, opportunities. What about the rest? Yeah, yeah. So when you quit, you were already having these gigs which were going to pay you better amounts or you no. had to discover this? They were not already paying me enough. They were paying... Uh, so I quit at a time when uh, my music had... I had started... Just started getting gigs which uh, have a little better money. Mm. Um, and then I taught for a long time. I still teach. Uh, I, I made teaching as my main uh, source of uh, livelihood. Yeah. So I would teach a lot. I would organize. I would host. I would write, uh, do some research. I would do all of that. I would write articles also like artist interviews. All that I've done. Okay. So all that was going on side by side. And uh, so that I was able to sustain. <laughs> So the reason I'm asking is attitude makeover mm -hmm. is all about reboots, right? Like I, when I took the plunge, I realized people don't talk about how hard it is to yeah. go through it. Yes. And they just call and say, wow, that's very bold. It's courageous. Yeah. 
it's nice to hear that but then when you go through it it's like you're shitting bricks over there yes. like, oh my god what was i thinking yes there are days when you yeah like, there are days of course there what are was days. i thinking kind of thing no i i didn't have such days but uh, there are days when you feel the pinch of the bank balance yes yes not any other thing it's absolutely. only the money which pinches you because absolutely corporate yeah. job will give you a salary and be on yeah. the first of the month yeah. whereas this is different yeah and then you pack lock stock barrel move to bombay yes <laughs> tell was, me a little bit about that how was that a journey uh it was a mad one i i don't know how i made that decision uh with a small child in my arms i decided to move cities and uh, relocate twi- thrice there also for into different houses and um i just knew one thing that for the next leg of progress in my music i had to move to mumbai uh i had quit my job started doing music full time now i needed to move to mumbai so that my concert connections and everything would get much stronger my network would get much stronger mm. i am not a born networker mm. i am not a born socializing kind of person i don't find the instant friends that way um, Im- immediately and you know it takes a little time yeah. but uh, i gave myself two years i said two years either i set up in mumbai or i just lose the rent which i paid in mumbai come back to bangalore and go back to square one uh, luckily my in- investment of time and uh, uh, energy in mumbai really paid off and uh, i am very happy there i settled there and got my kid into a good school and these connections are working well for me so and i have one thing is that sufi music if you're a sufi musician or a ghazal singer and you are living in mumbai anyone who comes from the rest of the country where they look for they look into mumbai for artists they are more convinced that this person could be serious about their profession if i was sitting in bangalore and trying to be a sufi musician the conviction on the part of the host or organizer to approach you and call you is not there he's not that convinced of your story he's not convinced that a kannadiga can sing sufi music yeah. um and south indian singing sufi madrasi singing sufi is beyond uh, you know uh, imagination they can't fathom such a thing once you're in mumbai all that gets erased you're you're, just, you're a mumbai just actor. naturally just naturally there are people like hari haran and shankar mm. mahadevan who have you know broken all the gl- uh, glass ceilings and broken all the stereotypes and have become so successful True. Uh, in singing in urdu and you know, doing hindi music so beautifully yeah. that people then uh, feel that it. yeah if you're in mumbai they'll accept it wow <laughs> rekha hema malini all of them are <coughs> tamilians who have made it sri devi done so well in the hindi film industry and uh, their hindi is not bad at all yeah. uh, so they got i mean they got acceptance but with musicians it's even been it's gone to the next level there are so many south indian musicians doing amazing music in the hindi urdu kind of uh, in these languages i have one question here one of the most pivotal things in all of this that we spoke so far is that belief in yourself i often find as as women also some men that belief in yourself is not there and when you don't have that is when you sort of get very complacent with your comfort or where you are today when you have that belief that sort of it's like some kind of a um, boost yeah. that comes from within yeah to take that plunge and take that thing and say we'll figure it out hmm you have that belief in you that you can figure it out not necessarily i beg to differ here okay. either you have the belief that you that uh, you can go f- propel yourself forward or you have this mad urge and a calling that no matter whether i'm good or bad he is going to take me there some of something is taking me there let me go <laughs> okay yeah. so it's not like i was oozing with confidence or you know i thought i was so good that i would make it no no But you've already done 10 years of this you've seen the still, energy coming back from your audience still you feel you're a seeker and mm. uh, for the longest time you're told told to be humble to be modest and as a south indian it comes naturally you're always underplaying your achievements underplaying the riches underplaying everything mm. so it uh, that gets ingrained to your belief system yeah so it was not i was not using confidence and oh, wow i know have everything to go i knew there was a calling there was a deep calling and the the pull was so strong that i had to go in that direction i i can understand this because for me that's see i'm not a natural in front of the camera i'm a very 
I struggle to meet new people, to hold conversations is really hard. So this is not natural for me. But somehow it's that whole, I don't know what it is. Yes. There's a there's something pulling you yes. towards it. Yes. And that gives you the energy, the confidence, the stamina and everything else. True. So when I went to Mumbai, I, I mean, people now call me brave. I yeah. didn't think I was brave. I Probably someone was also thinking I was foolhardy. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't think I was foolhardy, nor did I think I was brave. I thought I was taking calculated risk and worked in my favor. I thought something was pulling me so much. I should go in that direction. So free music was... Completely, it was uh, not a logical decision. It was not a rational decision. Nothing to do with the intellect. Something was calling me and I was going in that direction. It was also probably the adversity you're going through. You had connected with yeah. Sufism. There was an yeah. Yeah. internal connection. You yeah, but that I, uh, yeah, I could have listened and stopped at that. Yeah. But I started performing and I wanted to spread that word. Yeah. And I wanted to sing that kind of music. Yeah. And uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, get uh, soaked immersed in that. In. Yeah, immersed in that. So, stock trading or songwriting? <laughs> I don't write songs. Oh, you, okay. I don't write. Okay. I take the lyrics of good uh, poets. And our country has such Quantum. a great heritage. Yeah. Uh, so I take uh, lyrics and which are already written by good poets and I compose. So you compose them? Yes. Okay. So if you ask composing versus stock trading, uh, well, bit of both for different times. <laughs> you know, uh, when you're feeling a little adventurous uh, with a little... Uh, it's all different levels of dopamine, I guess. Tell me more. So uh, composing music gives you a high. Mm. Um and, but you have to be in that zone. Mm. Now, even stock trading is, of course, stock trading is more like, okay, I can make some money out of this on the side. But reading charts, analyzing, it gives me a high only when I've gone right somewhere mm. and I've predicted something like going from 35 to 100 mm. uh, and I could catch that wave. Mm. But in composing, if you compose something good, it's there for all. I mean, it's not a uh, momentary pleasure. Yeah, It's there uh, lifelong. Long. Yeah. Some of my compositions that I sing when people react well to it, years after it's been composed, I feel uh, it's very rewarding. It still comes back. Yeah. yeah. yeah, And it's your, it's yours forever. True. True. But uh, you cannot keep a stock forever. True. <laughs> <laughs> you can, but uh, theoretically you can. What's your favorite city to perform? Favorite, I should say, is Jodhpur and Hyderabad. Um, Mumbai, Pune, Bangalore. Uh, Chennai, all good. Where else have I been? This much. I have not gone into much of the east. Uh, east. Hmm. Are there people who listen from the east as well? People listen across the globe. Uh, but I seem to have more listeners on YouTube uh, and uh, social media coming from Middle East, US, Canada. Hmm. Some in uh, Europe. Hmm. Some from Australia, New Zealand as well. Not so much from uh, Southeast Asia, no. Okay. They probably don't listen to our music or they probably listen to Bollywood. I think that, that I wanted to talk to you about that also, but we'll come to that. Traditional instruments or modern tech music? Both are required. Modern tech to record the sounds huh. and recording technology is very nice. Uh, it has made music access. Uh, it has made recording accessible to even single uh, people like so, me. Uh, so, you know, sitting in a silo, I can record without much uh, expenditure or uh, things like that. Earlier, that was not possible. Mm. You needed to be part of the larger framework where you get to sing for a particular musician or a, for, for a particular music director and all that. Mm. Now I can create my own little music with a very uh, a small setup. Or basic equipment uh, and basic setup also I can create music. Which is a wonderful uh, gift. Yeah. It's a creator economy. Yeah. Itself. But traditional instruments cannot be done away with. True. Till today the sound of sarangi cannot be replaced by anything else. True. True. And tabla for that matter. You can't. No electronic stuff can match up. Very true. Yeah. One word to describe your journey so far. <laughs> it's been very interesting. I would at the end say joyful. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's been interesting and joyful. <laughs> <laughs> and what's a song that's currently on repeat in your playlist? Uh, in my playlist, no. Uh, 
there's no song on repeat in my playlist i often listen to uh, there's a song called aka huh. s- sung by abda parveen i i don't know how to, i mean i haven't sung it ever but that's nice because it any song that connects you in a prayerful way to the divine where we are uh, either asking him something or we are thanking him for helping us so much i somehow tend to like it <laughs> i actually like this uh, apita parveen right ha ha i think when i was like 8th or 9th standard my cousin was studying in nimhans and she had a bunch of they studied in jamshedpur they were from jamshedpur and she's doing her pg in nimhans so a bunch of her friends would come and give me these cds mm. and that's the first time and i don't know hindi so i would sit and ask for the meaning and then listen to her saying it's very mesmerizing yes, for yes. someone who doesn't know the language yes. also yeah. it's so beautiful so yes. that's how i got hooked on to yeah uh, sufi hosting. music itself has that uh, vibe because somewhere it uh, gives you a ray of hope mm. that god is there as a friend sufism is itself is like that so i went to christian institutions most of the time you studied in bangalore i studied in bangalore and uh, in a catholic school they would always say jesus is there for you god is there for you you pray and he'll forgive your sins mm. uh, and you you can always uh, he always loves you yeah. and you can always fall back on him uh, but as you as one grows up one realizes it's not that simple that he forgives you and everything will be clean uh, clean like a clean slate yeah. one has to pay for each and every consequence i mean that uh, hits you hard as you grow up and the unfairness in the world and how people treat you badly sadly whatever all that sort of hits you then you're like life isn't so simple then i i was accosted with um, the whole karma theory that karma is out to get you what no matter what that's the other extreme of this thing that you know god is not there only karma is going to t- finish you kind of thing it's it's fatalistic and it's very um, it's it's very hard it's a very hard philosophy then back to a time when i needed to fall fall back on something as my friend philosopher and divine hand holding energy uh, because you need that adversity gets you there so uh, again back to that you know god is a friend god is a loving uh, uh, energy uh, infinite intelligence and all that no doubt he can still help with the karma uh and maybe you can there are other ways of uh, rewriting your karma or uh, there are other ways of mitigating the effects mm. all that came in so it's been that kind of a journey with respect to belief uh, uh but then when you go and look for uh, this kind of god is loving towards you in the upanishads you'll still find them yeah. probably uh, a person who has not uh, read anything good in the gita or anything good in the upanishads Uh, to a hindu who who absolutely has not read the scriptures the first thing that strikes you is uh, one is idol worship one is karma Correct. neither of which is completely true you can you need not worship any idols because upanishads is completely formless but uh, hinduism has kept it such that all till your youth and till your marriage and at, uh, even after your marriage you do the ritualistic practice of hinduism then when you're old enough when you're past 45 you do you go supposed to go go yeah vana prasthashrama you're supposed to uh, go to a forest science and uh, you know understand the forest university from there so hinduism has kept formless worship till then uh, at that point of time yeah. and when you get the complete knowledge you are equipped to become a sanyasi and detach yourself completely yeah. we have postponed that formless uh, to that age Uh, yeah, i mean uh, with all due respect to the elders and and uh, ancient people and our ancestors but uh, sometimes many people need not go through that route at all mm-hmm. they're missing out on that big uh, treasure which is there mm-hmm. the vedanta uh, upanishads and they may well get into idol worship and go into the ramayana mahabharata and fall off there yeah still no they may never get else. there yeah. i i know many hindus who have never read the gita True. not touched one page of the upanishad leave alone even turning one page of the vedas mm. that's very sad no mm. our great tradition is getting lost somewhere mm. whereas uh, uh, i mean uh, i think i have seen many more christians reading the bible and many more muslims reading the quran mm. than many uh, many hindus reading 
uh, either the Gita or the Upanishads for that matter. Leave alone the Vedas. Yeah. One might call oneself a Brahmin, he would not have even touched one page of Veda. What is the use? That is no use. So one has to be scholarly and read the scriptures for us to be in touch with the Deva. How early were you introduced to both Hindustani classical and the spiritual side? Because I'm thinking it almost goes hand in hand. Or? Yeah. Strangely, Hindus, Hindustani classical music has so much of... Uh, earlier, I used to think it's all Sringaras, romantic, about Krishna, about uh, Krishna Leela and all those uh, Sas Nanad, uh, Nog Jhok and all those things. Our compositions are not like Carnatic compositions, which are very, um, which are of a very high standard and they're all Bhakti related. No, here there are even uh, slightly, you would say, uh, naughty, frivolous compositions at sure. the outset. But many of them speak about Krishna Radha in a very Sufi way is what I realized much later. It's a divine kind of mischief. It's a divine kind of love which is being spoken of. And there are many Sufi Khayals as well. So there is a hidden, if one wants to look for it, there is a hidden Sufism in Khayal music already. There's a lot of Bhakti. And Bhakti and Sufi are the two sides of the same coin as far as I'm concerned. You call. So you started with bhakti and then. No, Hindustani classical music is not strictly bhakti that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of compositions which are not, which are, uh, yeah, you may say bhakti, but not to Hindu gods and uh, yeah. not addressing Hindu gods and goddesses. Yeah. Yeah. It may be like that. Yeah. It may be a little naughty and you know a little uh, that way. Uh, speaking of the be uh, divine beloved. Yeah. So from that. Into more uh, of the uh, more, um, more straightforward uh, uh, Sufi or straightforward Bhakti is what I moved into with uh, music that has lyrics as the main uh, predominant uh, you know factor there. So that maybe I uh, uh, also ventured into a lot of Vachanas, Dasarpadas, uh, the Bhakti traditions of Karnataka, and then when you, when you change the language, it becomes Sufi, it becomes Urdu, Punjabi all those languages as well. So it was a transition that came, um, I should say naturally mm. and by divine providence, uh, but I've enjoyed it. And Khayal music is the base of every, uh, like any classical form is the base. Even Carnatic is the base of any singer's journey. Mm. Uh, who, I mean, if he, he or she is from South India, they would learn that way. So similarly, Hindustani classical is the base. Mm. So, uh, all my Sufi singing is with the base of that ragdari, alapchari, tan, bazi, all that comes from classical training. How young were you when you started? I was and 12. Did you have a musical background in the house, family? No, no, mm. I'm the, f uh, in the sense, uh, my aunt uh, uh, can sing, my mm. aunts can sing, my dad could sing, uh, and a uh, couple of musicians are there in the family, but uh, not on that level, and my father was not a musician. And not a uh, so that way I didn't have any uh, you know advantage that uh, uh, he he was uh, he had a musical mm. uh, no I have it in my DNA mm. but it was not a performing advantage <laughs> or a stage advantage or something. Got like it. That. Yeah. Got it. But you started very early. Yeah, he noticed my dad noticed my talent mm. and he got me uh, classes from standard four which I discontinued in six months mm. because we moved uh, our location. And then uh, from age 12, I've been trained. Throughout? Yeah. Throughout in the sense, learning is an endless process. So right now, I may not uh, I may not be actively training from a Hindustani classical Guruji. But still, uh, the learning goes on. Every day when you learn any new composition, any new, uh, there is a learning. There is a self-study going on. You learn new bandishes, you learn new, uh, maybe tumris, you learn new, new uh, ghazals, uh, Sufi Kalam. You learn to compose. It's a, it's a never-ending journey. You got into spirituality very early on in that case, right? Like, I'm sort of drawing a parallel when I was in my 25, even 35. I don't know if I was as God-fearing. Mm, I go to the temple, but I pray in the morning and the night. I read a lot. So, those were there, but I don't think as spiritual. Okay. As more like the happy-go-lucky sort of person and invest in my time in sports but beyond that nothing okay. but I feel like throughout your journey because of the music connection yeah, yeah. 
there's a growth in that spiritual side that you've gone through continuously as well or did yeah, it happen maybe maybe it was a uh, a divine plan i don't know what it is i i yeah music makes you a little bit spiritual mm. uh, the lyrics sort of uh, always stir i mean they call cause some kind of stirring inside mm. uh and then adversity teaches you if there's adversity invariably one turns to god yeah. uh, that's uh, the law of nature i think yeah. or god wants to <laughs> uh probably god also feels like what kind of an ungrateful human being have i created he comes to me only when he is in distress yeah. so uh, adversity teaches you a lot it's very humbling and it sends you towards the divine path which is probably what happened i was uh, i was like uh, wanting a child child never happened so many up, things were going up and down so i guess <laughs> that's a tough one i i don't think i am a really spiritual i'm still a wanna be <laughs> in that sense <laughs> i am i'm one there i think west just about the beginning yeah uh, same everyone <laughs> i think what does sufism mean to you in life it's the it's it's the way i uh, understand divine tell me a little more so sufism sort of uh, i was able to relate to sufi poetry so much or the sufi thought process so much because i completely um, agree or uh, resonate with that sort of belief system that god is a friend god is there for you uh, he's always there to uplift you he's accessible he's a personal god you don't have to go through rituals to reach him see when you uh, earlier i was i've always been a believer in god mm. there was a particular point of time when i would like chant the lalita sahasranama like every day and i was like a big fan of devi mm. um and i would uh, devi was everything to me and um, so every every uh, every patch of my life every phase of my life has been lot of bhakti Mm. lot of uh, chanting shlokas and uh, all those vishnu sahasra nama lalita sahasra nama everything um but still it was ritual oriented uh, you have to be clean you have to do this you have to do that you have to do upas and all those things um and worship in a certain way uh, all those things are attached to that yeah but sufism is like even if you are unclean god loves you even if you haven't had a bath you can still connect and pray to god you can think of god as a friend as a mother as a uh, divine beloved uh, of course divine beloved being the strongest of it all you, in a traditional uh, in the traditional uh, part of religion uh, god is not a divine beloved you don't you cannot call him your beloved mm. beloved here we have to i mean it's really hard for us to take away the hormonal part of love and uh, only the ethereal understand the ethereal part of love or something like that so only when one understands the common factor between mother child human nature uh, human and pet mm-hmm. or uh, father with his siblings when we understand uh, love as a common thread in all these places god to uh, god to creation yeah. only then we can understand what that kind of love is and that uh, uh, when you see when you love that force so beautifully so much that it's like uh, so close as a you know beloved very very close so that's when uh, that's that's what sufism has put into my belief of god could it also be you falling in love with yourself if you look at it uh, in a very advaitic way yeah if you look at yourself as part of the uh, like in one of the upanishads uh, they say that uh, all the souls are connected uh, like uh, beads mm. onto a big mala mm. if you think that way yeah uh, my self with a small s yeah. loving in being in love with the uh, self with the capital s yeah. you can think of it that way or to a low mortal even it could be uh, me in love with the divine force if you cannot understand that they are one because advaita is quite difficult uh, that way if you are into dvaita and if you think that god is separate from human and that you love the beloved and he is always there for you as a parent as a mother very comforting yeah. advaita that way is not so comforting it's not so friendly if you and if you if you've read the um, read the upanishads where 
your aspiration should be should be towards moksha mm. means getting uh, getting assimilated into that oneness and never coming back into this world it's mm. a very hard thought mm. it's very hard not not for us not to believe that we will not come back in this material form mm. in flesh and blood in this body of matter it's very difficult True. so this is more relatable yeah or probably we are into kali yuga and we cannot think of such a high status of spirituality that we will not come back into this birth and death cycle yeah yeah that song when you sang and god talking to the seeker how did you get into composing that i didn't compose it it's a composed by ustad aziz ahmed varshi sahab okay and i merely sing it it's a beautiful composition uh it's in uh, somewhat based on shana kanada uh, between bahar and uh, somewhere in the space of bahar miamalhar kanda okay so it was already composed i like that composition because it's one of the unique compositions where um the uh, where a seeker asks or god and god actually responds so that was one thing which was very unique and uh, written by amjad hyderabadi uh, i i really uh, liked Okay. I don't have the lyrics here but I'll try to say. Ah ah सबब से मांगो मिन्नत से खुशामद से अदब से मांगो क्यों गैर के आगे हाथ फैलाते बंदे हो अगर रब के तो रब से मांगो मायूस सायल ने जब घर की रानी आँखों में आंसू थे थी झोली खाली इतने में रहमत झुंझला के बोली मायूस जाता है क्यों हाथ खाली मायूस जाता है मायूस जाता है क्यों हाथ खाली ले हाथ फैला फिर मांग फिर ले हाथ फैला फिर मांग फिर मांग आ इधर आ फिर मांग फिर मांग साल इधर आ फिर मांग फिर मा I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to switch gear a bit now. Yeah. Stop trading. When I talked <laughs> to you, that was a total shock. And because I think that was an unconscious bias in my head. You know, an artist doesn't know finances. And then first was like you. When I spoke to you, you said I came from the corporate world. And that itself was like um, <laughs> wow. And then you talked about you know stock. trading has taught me so many life lessons yeah i want to hear that I, and i want to tell you it it has for me um as much as poker as well like poker okay. again is another game which really has taught me some fundamental life lessons yeah um and i thought i could resonate that with yeah. what you were saying tell me how did it happen what are some life lessons 
so it happened in covid i was uh, i thought i had some time and i could do something with uh, because it was an inner calling as well i knew that money will uh, somehow uh, find its way to me through the markets mm. and uh, whenever i've done any investment it has gone well mutual funds or whatever uh, some stocks and uh, it has been there in my family my mom uh, used to try some ipos and my uncles aunts some of them have been interested and uh, having come my mom is from the coast and coastal people think finances you're a mangi i am not a mangi i'm from my mother is from kundapur side okay so that uh, flavor that dna is there okay uh, so i i thought okay in the covid time i thought let me start and uh, so i took a lot of training and definitely it's very rewarding because uh, sometimes you can find very good multi baggers or whatever not multi baggers 10 baggers something something mm-hmm. that goes up well but the lessons that it teaches you is every day if you look at the stock market and if you have some idea that it will do this or according to the star, uh, chart reading you've learned the technical analysis if, if the chart i mean the candlesticks are formed like this then this is what's likely to happen mm-hmm. or if you uh, hear the bigger stories that you know dollar index is moving like this or gold is moving like this or crude is moving like this this may happen to the stock market uh, because they have some kind of a direct or inverse proportion uh, inverse relationship but when the opposite happens it's very humbling mm-hmm. and each day the market teaches you you're going in a certain path suppose you've taken a trade so you you know going in a certain path if it does something opposite how you handle your emotions mm-hmm. how you do mid course corrections mm. how you treat every day as a new day and you start over again and you try something when it changes it's like playing a sometimes it's like playing a video game you have to adapt to it and quickly move true, true. and you can't take yourself very seriously true. the moment you start saying okay i am i have arrived i know how to do this it then the market will teach you a beautiful mm. lesson yes. it's a way of you know uh, reducing the ego yeah I feel that's the biggest thing that stock market gives you. Yeah. It reduces your ego and the moment your ego is reduced you are able to make money. Yeah. The moment you are able to detach yourself from the concept of money it will give you money. Yeah. The moment you are able to detach from reward and either the carrot and stick or reward or punishment then it gives you money. <laughs> I think what you're also saying is you become very aware of your relationship with money as well. Yes right? and and your inner demons. Yes. Yes. That you hold on to something yeah. that's not worth holding on to yeah. you uh, let go of things that uh, are there for you yeah. uh, and you you know you take them too lightly and you let go yeah. that is you book profits too early yeah. and you hold on to losses yeah. all that is i think uh, part of human nature yeah. if there are people uh, you know as our strong companions and friends we take them too lightly mm-hmm. we hanker for something that we don't have yeah. this is what <laughs> what's not in your control yes can really change the course Yes as well. And you learn how to handle that things are not going to be in your control that you cannot assume that they are going to be in your control and you deal with only those things which you mm-hmm. can control which is your own attitude towards it yeah. your own equation with it. Yeah. Was there a humbling humbling experience you went through? Oh, not one every day plenty. <laughs> like the last two weeks have been crazy for us. Okay. Uh, we I think the market has been doing really well. Yeah. and every time we put up a uh, buy on certain numbers it goes completely heavy and then the two of us are like oh my god what is happening yeah. <laughs> so it's very important to understand your own relationship and if both of us are investing it's our relationship with money as well yeah. it's complex there then, yeah yeah right? yeah yeah Wow. Also the market uh, has a way of uh, doing mean, mean reversion always. Mm. So when it reaches a state of exuberance then it just crashes and brings everyone down. Yeah. to the mean. Yeah. And then again it gives you a chance or maybe if it goes back down uh, it, it really crashes then it'll also give you a ray of hope and come back to the mean. So there are these phases when it'll always bring you to the mean point. Yeah. which is uh, you know the way life works if you're too happy and if you're floating on the ninth uh, cloud nine you may be brought down to earth sometime yeah. and when you're in patal sometime it will you know take, take you up, up. Yeah. Yeah. wow what a beautiful <laughs> analogy what kind of workshops did you attend were you always financially savvy or financially savvy um, maybe but i've been lucky 
I've been blessed with financial comfort. Yeah. Financial comfort has always been there ever since I started working. Yeah. And uh, that's a blessing. Yeah. I can't take credit for it, but God has been just too kind. And uh, I don't come from a finance background. I don't uh, necessarily look at the fundamentals while picking a stock and holding it for some time. But what I would hold on to, uh, to for a longer time, yes. Mm. It has to be fundamentally also sound. And charts have to show that it's ready to take off and then you would. But some stocks like uh, HDFC Bank or, you know, uh, maybe Reliance to some people or maybe Nestle, Hindustan Diva, these are not going to vanish away in the next few years. Mm. And if anyone thinks that HDFC Bank is at risk, India story is only at risk. Yeah. So you just buy them and keep them. True. It may not do wonders. It, it will not also probably do wonders. It will not uh, give you upper circuit in, uh, in one day. Yeah. It will not do such wonders. It may not become multi bagger right now. Yeah. But you hold on to it because you believe in, in, believe in the India story. Yeah. Nestle and all daily uh, people are going, not going to stop uh, drink, have, uh, you know, using milk powder from Nestle. Not going to stop uh, Maggie. Those are going to live forever. No matter how many people try to copy Maggie with all kinds of bad advertisements saying it has lead, it has, uh, you know, plutonium, palladium, titanium, silicon. <laughs> Nobody will believe this story. <laughs> it will be always celebrated. Because Maggie, in, in the hilly regions of India, I find that, that Maggie is a staple food. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah very true. Mm. That's all you get actually. Some places. Like mm. I remember we went to Sikkim. Mm. There's this place called Tangu. It's like this highest point. This is where the army base is. Just before that lake. I think it's a Chandrata lake or something. Mm. There are only two houses. Mm. And there's no food, nothing. It's only Maggie <laughs> right there. Yeah. And that's it. That's, yeah. that's all you get. And so you're right. So actually. Maggie is uh, such an important... So when Nestle has captured such an important market of India or of the world. But Maggie India is very specific yeah. uh, probably here. Yeah. So, they are never going to go out of business. Yeah, yeah. So, investing in such a business or maybe, uh, for instance, page industries who make undergarments. Mm -hmm. Undergarments are never going to go out of, yeah, permanent customers. Yeah. No, no, I, I I was in sales, right? Yeah. So, they were one of my customers. Okay. Um, page, Asian Paints yeah. is another one. Yeah. It's just like a Asian Paints story. has a yeah, very unique distribution model. They yeah. have a moat around their business. So, they are never going to go out yeah. is what I feel. Yeah. They, have, they may have the, you know, five step up and three step down, but ultimately it will go up is what one believes. What a beautiful combination you have, okay? You have the insights of what's really happening, the big picture, because that is what stocks and trading really teaches you as well. You can't trade without having the bigger picture. Bigger picture. You cannot do that without really being abreast with what's really happening. <laughs> Geopolitics geoeconomics, India's <laughs> economics, you can't trade. Then you have this beautiful spiritual side and this voice, <laughs> such a giver in that space. Thank and you. then you have this belief in yourself as you go through this journey. Lovely combination. Thank you. But I'm thinking it's a journey that has brought you to yeah. who you are today, right? I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. The life's up, ups and downs, the roller coaster of life probably shapes you. For someone going through change and just contemplating, thinking is it worthwhile, is there a message you want to give, Smita? Yeah. Do follow your passion. Follow Do it. follow your passion. Do go after what you really believe in. Go after what is, uh, I mean, your calling. And definitely there'll be a reward. If you have the passion, there'll be a reward. Because the moment you say you have passion, you're manifesting your reward. Yeah. And it works. For a moment, I would say, don't think of any negatives that can come up. You know, sometimes uh, there is a particular leader in our country of the opposition. People belittle him all the time. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't bother about any belittling, it, it seems. Yeah. It seems to a normal person that he is just going after his one goal. He wanted to go from one end of the country to the, to the other. He just... Uh, he just... Uh, kept away from listening to any of his uh, uh, detractors yeah. and the naysayers. Yeah. He just went on his path. Yeah. And even till, till, till today, the content that he makes, people seem to be loving. Why he's showing ordinary interaction with some carpenter, with some mechanic. It is so endearing sometimes. Yeah. I learned a lesson from there. He is not worried about his competitors. Yeah. He, they might be doing a lot of competition analysis. He's not worried. 
he's just creating his own content and his own pathway just like many or most of the artists do they don't worry whether the one song is doing well or one movie is doing well they enjoy those movies they create their own content that's the space of a true creator that's the space of flow and a person who's interested in going behind their goals they sort of create it so, uh, like that and they also if they're not creating they should be in this path just focus on your goals just focus on your dreams and the future of musicians are there things that you would like to see change especially as a woman artist i haven't faced many hardships that uh, i want to uh, talk about but in the sense that uh, as a woman it's the same for it's a man and woman the thing is that there's no funding for artists who don't come from the mainstream popular categories there's there are a lot of good talented artists out there who are waiting for not opportunities but who are waiting for platforms to go and perform mm. so that they can earn mm. it's not like if i get this one opportunity and i make it i'll get livelihood throughout my life no there are many uh, uh, reality show winners who don't have so much of work so they get their moment in the sun under the sun or under the arc lights but uh, they don't get a regular so- source of income so my mate yeah so so in india you cannot just be an artist and you know get, get jobs you cannot be a music teacher and earn commensurate to a professor or something that's also difficult and for that you need to do musical exams which are not so of such good standard here mm-hmm. whereas in a european country maybe you can uh, just train to be a musician and work as a musician and you'll lead a decent uh, life mm-hmm. and uh, you'll also probably get to perform at gigs and so on I don't know the entire picture but it seems like that from what we see. Mm-hmm. There should be a support system for musicians. Traditional musicians should get the support of big corporate houses Tata's, Billas, uh, Ambani's, Adani and so on and so forth. <laughs> I think they should channel their money here, right? Yes. If you could perform a duet hmm. with any musician past or present, who would it be? Wouter Kellerman. Wouter Kellerman. I like to work. What is he? Uh, he's an instrument player. He's yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he plays the flute and he does a lot of music. I definitely would like to I somehow like his music and I like the uh, way he he's so versatile and he works across genres and with different artists. So uh, that's what's like, his name? Wouter Kellerman. Wouter Kellerman. W O U T E R Wouter Kellerman. And where did you find him? I heard him at Jodhpur Riff. Oh, so and uh, I was very impressed with his. Uh, oh, this year? Not this year. Okay. Uh, some I think maybe two thousand eighteen or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I liked his work a lot. I heard you first at Riff. Okay. I think about four five years back is okay. when I first uh, heard you. Okay. And this time also I was there. Okay. Uh, I'm there most of the time. So okay. And, uh, My husband heard you for the first time this time and okay. he's like uh, I kept ra- raving about it last time. <laughs> he's like I can understand why. Oh, that's sweet. How kind of it. What's the most unusual place you've ever been inspired to sing? Unusual. I can't think of any unusual place. Usually I've played at festivals, okay. I've sung at festivals. But maybe uh There was a slum event actually at uh, BKC mm. where I sang briefly that was interesting uh so that's the only unusual place otherwise I haven't performed at I This is for the whole slum No no this was just an event where a uh, madrasa was being converted uh, or rather uh, a sort of new kind of madrasa where Ma, a school like madrasa was being either refurbished or something like that mm. uh, there uh, and a library was being created So there I had a chance to attend that event. Mm-hmm. So that was nice. Yeah. If you had to describe your life as a raga, which <laughs> one would it be and why? It would be the most joyous one for some reason. Uh it would be oh, lovely. It would be Yaman, it would be Bhopali, it would be Shivranjini. I think it would be so many ragas because actually although joyful, there are other flavors as well. Sometimes I mean life is not always a uh, sweet right. yeah it has uh, flavors of everything yeah. but overall the overarching theme would be of joy
I see that in your songs as well. <laughs> What's the one song that always makes you dance, no matter what your mood is? Any Punjabi bhangra, oh, yeah. any Punjabi song usually makes me dance. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it could be there are so many Punjabi singers. There's this guy called uh, Satinder Sardar, and mm. I don't listen to them regularly, mm. but I li- that kind of music is to pep you up. But I personally don't. Uh, I use that for more like workouts or when I'm uh, wanting to shake a leg or two at home just to uh, chill. Mm. But otherwise, uh, uh, but otherwise, what do you listen to? I listen to uh, I listen to oh. quite a few genres. I listen to folk sometimes. Uh, I listen to K-pop nowadays. Thanks to my daughter, <laughs> Taylor Swift. Uh, I so you're a Swifty to- as well. I'm not a Swifty, but her songs come onto my lips because she listens to it so often. Uh, I like the way uh, they have all projected their career so beautifully and uh, handled their uh, lives, uh, you know, str- uh, I can't say struggle, but their life journey so well. Uh, I'm not a fan of that kind of music. I like anything that's more soulful or that touches. Uh, I like, uh, sometimes I like folk music from other countries as well. Uh, that is something that's touching is always nice. Do you collaborate often with uh, artists from elsewhere? Not so often. Mm-hmm. I've got a chance to collaborate uh, twice or thrice and that was nice. Very cool. Yeah. Have you ever forgotten your lyrics mid-performance? Yeah, plenty mm-hmm. of times, every time. What do you do then? Look at the lyrics. <laughs> so you pause, look at the lyrics and continue. Yeah, sometimes uh, also I fumble mm-hmm. and then you have to quickly... <laughs> Can't help it. See, mine, uh, I've transitioned now to music that is um, uh, lyric predominant. Mm. I mean, everything's about the lyrics. Mm. Now, every performance, if you're going to learn four or five new songs and present them, then lyrics are quite a challenge. And my, I've not trained my memory enough to learn all of them by rote. Yeah. So I still look at the lyrics. And uh, while there is a school of thought that says that when you memorize your lyrics, it's the best performance. But uh, by looking at the lyrics, I get a certain amount of concentration on my music. It's It sounds weird, but uh, I get I get uh, concentration. You're able to focus. Yeah. Uh, but in the performing field, people don't expect that of you. People expect you to perform like a performer. Mm. Uh, you know, completely. For me, sometimes I'd like to... Uh, shut my eyes and sing to to somewhere else. I mean, I'm not necessarily addressing a particular person in the audience. Yeah. I'm singing to the bigger energies or to the universe or the divine uh, yeah, beloved. Yeah, yeah. So that time it becomes uh, difficult to um, uh, be a performer. Mm. So, but you can't help it. <laughs> I've seen that in um, the riff especially. Yeah. And, and then actually, um, it's also the way you... <clears throat> introduce the poetry in the song uh, before you start. That's really beautiful. The way you. you go about introducing that um, to the audience. That's really lovely. Thank you. If you could have any superpower for a day, what would that be? I would eradicate des- death and destruction. Death? Death, destruction, poverty, <laughs> disease. <laughs> that is ideal. I mean, that's not to be done. Uh, in the sense, God has probably created a balance with all these things and I'm no one to shatter that balance. Maybe poverty and disease. I don't know. Yeah. It's very uh, it's very striking when the haves and have nots, the divide gets bigger and bigger Why each time. Yeah. And you one is just a mute spe- spectator and one is blessed to have uh, financial comfort and uh, let's say I do everything uh, in order to go towards the haves. Mm. Uh, and there is very little that's going from the haves to the have-nots. True. And people say it's manifestation. People say they don't want to change their own circumstances or they have certain patterns of belief. Whatever it is, it's very sad. Mm-hmm. Especially if, uh, when you see children who have no uh, fault of their own. Just born in. Born into poverty, born into handicapped situations or born into uh, exploitation of the worst kind. That is really very, very touching. True. And I think as you travel, you must have exposed yourself to a lot more of no, India uh, in that way. Or? No, the, new, the news is bad enough. <laughs> I don't subscribe to any newspaper and I don't uh, have any TV channels. Of, uh, I don't have a TV subscription. Mm-hmm. Still, the little news that comes, I don't know, it always finds me, I think. 
Uh, it's very disturbing to find the level of exploitation, the way women are being treated. It's uh, amazingly cruel these days. Sure. What's the quirkiest habit you have that your fans don't know about? Uh, I think so quirky. I drink uh, black coffee nowadays throughout my performance. <laughs> Oh, you drink with coffee before? Uh, that's one question. Even through the performance. Yeah? Yeah, and even in the night. I mean, who drinks coffee in the night? Can Neen nahi aega na? Neen to nahi, bhi nahi aati because uh, when you are uh, in sa- on such a high, it takes some time for the dopamine to sort of reduce and the next day is a lot of unwind. But, uh, and the build up to the performance is like, I, I for me, every performance is like a big exam. Mm. So the build up is quite, it a lot yeah. and when one is trying to be mom artist manager of the house taking care of the menu and everything one is stretching oneself uh, a lot yeah. so sometimes before the concert uh, the t- uh, pressure is quite high mm. Mm. so uh, and coffee only adds to that mm. adds to the stimulation part mm. of it mm. so that's so when you're singing you actually have coffee. I have black coffee nowadays I've given up on dairy so if your life was a movie which actress would you want to play your role? Earlier it was Meena Kumari. Mm. Now I think it should be, I don't know, Madhubala. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one you answered. Coffee or chai, what's your go-to drink before a performance? Chai was always my go-to drink until recently when I gave up dairy. Mm. And I can't drink tea black without sugar. Oh, That's somehow a mindset. I can drink coffee black uh, without sugar. And of course, I don't drink it strong. Mm. It's very diluted. Mm. But I still have my black, black coffee. I love it. So it's a drink every day? <laughs> I drink every day, twice, twice a day. And during my concerts, I feel it gives me a little more energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes when I go for three hours, yeah. <coughs> singing for three hours, uh, it uh, spikes the glucose a little bit, or they say, yeah. or at least it stimulates the body a little bit. True, it does. It so does. that way it helps. What's the most interesting sound you've incorporated into your music? Sounds I don't know. Maybe uh, there's nothing so special I've incorporated. No? No. When my programmers give me new sounds, like new instruments they only bring in. Mm. And if I like it, I uh, selected it. Maybe some kind of oboe or some kind of a different string instrument from Middle East or something. But very rarely have I used that. Very rarely. So when you go to a concert, you already know who yeah. else is there, what Yeah, that's more regular stuff. Okay. I hardly get, uh, you know, exotic instruments there. Okay. okay. So that's uh, something that I look forward to. Uh, to have, you know, more um, variety of instruments. Mm. But that comes only with collaboration from artists uh, across the world, mm. across mm. the globe. Mm. And I really wish for it, yes. I hope that comes yeah. true because I think you're such a lovely <laughs> artist. Achha. Morning riyas or late night jam sessions? Both. Yeah? Both, I would like. Are you a morning person? Yeah, very much. Uh-huh. Yeah. Morning, I don't mind. And jams usually happen late night or rehearsals go sometimes a little late. Mm-hmm. You cannot avoid that. But uh, morning riyas is equally good. I like both. Your neighbors must be having a ball, no? No, they can't really hear me. My voice won't carry till their house where they are. Uh, they, it'll carry till their door. So, it's okay. Enough to be your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know you're a khayal singer. Yeah. But And we'll get into the fundamentals of what it means. But Sufi or khayal, classical khayal, what do you prefer? Actually, it isn't uh, and or situation. It's, it isn't binary. It's not One is incorporated into the other is what I feel. So in Khayal, we use Akar to uh, develop or to interpret the Swaras of the Raga or to embellish them and bring them out. Mm. So th- we, using Akar is something very abstract where the audience has an inkling what's going on in the Raga where the Alaps are being developed, but it's still uh, abstract to them. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, but when there are lyrics to go with it, it in- invariably makes it easier to understand and the expression or the emotion uh, that the singer is trying to convey, the artist is trying to convey, gets into you more easily. Oh, can you give me an example? The words uh, carry the emotion, right? Mm. And now if I sing, uh, let's say something, uh, 
Let's take this for instance. It is a Sunday record. Yeah? Yeah. Raga is trying to convey wow. because the swaras have their own effect on the human mind. But if I accompany this with lyrics, it becomes that much more easy to understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
जो याद नाए भूल के फिर हम फसों वो याद है हम वो खाब है हम ढूंढोगे घर मुल्को मुल्को और फिर तो एक पर्दा मैटर जो कि कलश चल के जो कि कलश चल के हे गुलाबी लाल सुने रंग दल बादल के जो कि कलश चल के सम जॉय हिडन जॉय इज देर एंड मोस्ट द वर्ड्स ऑल्सो अपेयर मोर दे यू कैन रिलेट टू देम मोर या इवन इफ आई सिंग आ मन कुंतो Somewhere it the words help in getting the emotion easily. Although ragas uh, have their own effect on the human mind, uh, regardless of the words, even Akar will can uh, express, express emotion. It's beautiful. <laughs> God, I love this because I never had a private session like this. So beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> live concerts or studio recordings? Live. Why? Because live you get audience get uh, feedback theme. immediately. The energy is there. Yeah. In a studio, everything is mostly wood mm. or uh, covered with uh, materials that absorb the echoes or yeah. whatever. So acoustically done up. So it all absorb. It yeah. absorbs all kinds of <laughs> bounce of yeah. energies. Yeah. So it's uh, more compact. The sound is great probably, but you don't get the human interaction. You don't. Get the audience feedback, and most often the sound engineer, no, no matter how much he might uh, appreciate your music, after three four takes of the same thing, he'll also get uh, bugged, or he'll also okay, he'll stop enjoying. Yeah. First few times you can enjoy, yeah. later he won't enjoy. Yeah. yeah. So, or if he's hearing the same song going on, only in certain places he will probably feel, but he'll be concentrating on his job so much mm-hmm. that he has to look for mistakes or look for in order Relates to help record. Yeah. yeah. So audience is not like that. They love it as it comes because it's a live session. Yeah. Uh, also, um, our live miking is such that it uh, uh, doesn't uh, catch very very minute breath differences and wind and all such things. So it's a nice, well-rounded ambient. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, it's nice and well-rounded. Sometimes ambient sounds get into it, and there's a leakage from the other instruments. But it's a pleasant, warm sound. Yeah. Vishmita, thank you so much. One last question: What does attitude makeover mean to you? Attitude maker, attitude makeover is such a powerful concept that when I said uh, when I said I'm going for an interview, uh, it's uh, called attitude makeover. I mean, everyone was uh, struck by that uh, yeah. name. To me, it signifies empowering yourself for. the next leg of your progress yes. it signifies what you need to get equipped with for the next leg of your progress for the next leg of your life for that higher notch that one is looking for it's not necessarily moving from one un- one zone of comfort to the next zone of discomfort but here uh, even if you are on a zone of comfort or whatever even there if you want to make progress in the same field the next notch higher will require different a uh, different attitude because what got you till here will not get you to the next level so it's very very powerful and i i find this concept brilliant thank you thank you so amazing much. thank you sita so, thank you so much for this thank lovely you conversation thank you too. i had a fabulous time i never had someone sing this beautifully <laughs> for me thank you thank, thank you so much thank you too and thank you. Uh, hopefully we'll stay in touch and get yes. to see more of your concerts yes we should and meet more often absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. thank you